Hi everyone, welcome to the first virtual center. Thank you all for joining with us today. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Sri Kairanti and I'm a rising sophomore and I'm the organizer for this event. Since I was in fourth grade, I have attended and participated in multiple technology fairs. I wanted an opportunity, I, I wanted to give an opportunity to other students during the COVID-19 pandemic so that they can uh, have an opportunity to explore new STEM topics and better their presentational skills. I have had great responses in the upcoming July and, and the August event, and I plan on organizing more events in the near future. We have a lot of exciting topics which will be presented in today's event, and we have a couple of exciting hours ahead of us. But before we jump into topics, we have, a, we have something from our guest speaker, Dr. Bronfman, who was my teacher at, uh, last year, who taught me STEM and PLTW. So let's watch this video. Hello, my name is Dr. Brotman. I had my initial training in chemistry and now have the opportunity to be able to guide students through many areas of STEM. And I wanna take this opportunity to be able to welcome you to this STEM conference. I would also like to thank Shrikar for putting this conference together. I'm certain that all of you appreciate the time that he has spent in guiding you through the process of your investigations as well as in putting together your presentation. As we look at the areas of STEM, we're taken by how you bring individual aspects together collab through collaboration to be able to come up with a way to solve a problem. As we look at the different components, we can understand how science gives us our basic understanding for how the universe works. Engineering builds on those understanding to be able to apply them to solve particular problems. Technology is involved in both of those areas as bringing those engineering designs to life, as well as providing the scientists with numerous tools for their investigation in their different areas. Mathematics is interwoven in all of those, making them possible. As we consider that STEM is involved in solving society's problems of needs and wants, we have to realize that there are many different forms for our effort. Figuring out how to solve a problem is not a simple task, as I'm sure most of you can agree to. Please consider the different areas on the left that are involved in learning and understanding. And I'm sure that all of you will agree that you have gone through this journey to be able to say, I think, I question, I design, I create, I struggle, I collaborate, I try, I solve, I invent, and after all of that is over, I also reflect. These are many areas that are involved in learning. I'd like to share with you a few words of inspiration that have helped me along my areas as a scientist and as a STEM teacher. Scientist Carl Sagan once said, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. We are all anxiously waiting to learn about your areas because there truly there is something incredible waiting to be known. I'm certain that all of you are familiar with Albert Einstein and among his many quotes, here are a couple that have inspired me over the years. He has said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Solving the problems is going to require us to go far beyond what we initially knew. 
In addition, he believed that, and I quote, to raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks real advance in science. This is indeed so true, as each one of you are looking at your different topic areas with a new angle and adding in your own imagination. Mae Jameson is both an astronaut and a physician. And here's one of the things that has also inspired me that she has said. It's your place in the world. It's your life. Go on and do all you can with it and make it the life you want to live. Right now we are being faced with a crisis in the world because of COVID-19. People are coming together with their talents, using the collaborative nature of STEM, as many of the different areas related to STEM are shown on the bottom here. These people are working, as I said, collaboratively to help in every aspect of dealing with this pandemic. So even if we are not always able to get together in person to be able to talk over the different areas of STEM and how we can solve problems, we can, through conferences like this, continue to explore avenues to be able to help solve society's problems of needs and wants, and right now to solve problems of COVID-19. Thank you again for your wonderful work. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Bronkman, for that. Now let's take a look into what topics will be presented about in today's event. First, we have 5G compared and explained. Next, we have different kinds of um, uh, energy and how they are created. And then invasive species, a voyage to the International Space Station, Lego EV3 robotics, and finally AI and biological intelligence. Looks like we have some great topics in store for today's event. Also, check out my website, stemfairs.com, for information about future events and additional information with sign-up links. The recording to this event will be posted on my YouTube channel, STEM Explorers. Share the link of the video with others, and remember to like and subscribe. Please hold your questions until the end and type them in the chat, and I will ask them to the presenters. So first, let's begin with the first presenter, Shivy. She is from the suburbs of... Um, of Chicago, and she will be uh, presenting about 5G. Surely 5G has a large part in her future. Shaivi, you can now start presenting. Hello everyone, my name is Shaivi Wan Katie, and today I'm gonna to explain to you about 5G wireless network compared and explained. Table of contents. One, what is 5G? This will be the basic overview and foundations of 5G. Two, how does 5G compare to other networks? This is how 5G compares to 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and Wi-Fi. Three, how is 5G produced? This is how 5G cell towers work and how they look like. Four, small cells. This is how small cells work and why we need them. Five, how can 5G impact our future? This is how 5G can benefit us and the con side. And six, the conclusion and revision of the presentation. One, overview of 5G. What is 5G? 5G is the fifth generation of wireless cellular networks. It was designed to increase the speed and response of wireless networks. Data will be faster transmitted through wireless devices due to higher bandwidth and advanced antenna technology. This means that 5G is essentially a network that is made to have faster response times. But 5G can do much more and can lead to a change in the future. 5G foundations, millimeter waves, small cells, 
massive MIMO, beam forming, and full duplex. Millimeter rates. Most of our devices use about three kilohertz to six gigahertz of data. This is what is known as the sub six. Now, 5G allows us to use the six gigahertz to 300 gigahertz part of the spectrum. This way, we have more data and this means higher frequency. Since millimeter waves have high frequencies, these frequencies can go through objects that well, and small cells can help on that, but I'll explain more on that later. This is an example of a small cell. MIMO. MIMO is multiple input, multiple output. There's a transmitter and a receiver that send and receive information like is shown on the left image. The right image shows how a MIMO antenna looks like. This is beamforming. It works like a traffic light. Instead of broadcasting to every signal, it gives each device a dedicated path that allows efficiency and less collision. Like you can see in this diagram here. In the left image, the Wi-Fi router broadcasts to every device. In the Wi-Fi router with beamforming, it gives each device a dedicated path. Full duplex. Full duplex is like what is shown above. It allows transmissions to move around each other and to avoid collision. Wi-Fi uses half duplex, which has a signal path that moves only one way. 5G has full duplex, which moves both directions at the same time. Two, 5G compared to other networks. This table shows the starting development, frequency, and bandwidth of 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. The starting development for 1G was 1970 to 1984, with a frequency about 30 kilohertz and a bandwidth of two kilobits per second. 2G started development at 1980 to 1999 with the frequency of 1.8 gigahertz and a bandwidth of 14.4 to 65 kilobits per second. 3G started development at 1990 to 2002 with a frequency of 1.6 to 2 gigahertz and bandwidth of two megabits per second. 4G started development of 2000 to 2010 with a frequency of 2.8 gigahertz to 8 gigahertz and a bit bandwidth of 2000 megabits to 1 gigabits. And 5G started development from 2010 to 2015, the frequency of 3 to 30 gigahertz and bandwidth of 1 gigabits and higher. 1G, 2G, 3G, and 4G. 1G brought us the first phone, which allowed us to use voice communication. 2G allowed us to use a text mechanism. 3G allowed us to access the internet. And 4G is what most of us use today, which gives us the speed we all love. Yet users want more speed and more data on their devices. And that's what 5G helps us in. How is 5G different than Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi has less gigahertz, about 2.4, but Wi-Fi tends to penetrate the walls and such and can't guarantee fast speeds. On the other hand, 5G can deliver fast speeds but can't penetrate through things as well. This brings us to the point that higher frequency are weaker to obstacles but give us high speeds, and this is vice versa for lower frequency. Also, 5G uses full duplex, while Wi-Fi only uses half. How is 5G compared against 4G? As the IoT gets bigger, the Internet of Things, 4G will not be able to handle so much traffic and ensure high speeds, yet 5G can. 5G has new frequency bands, lower latency, and is connected by other devices instead of bases. This allows 5G to easily organize the IoT and give high speeds. 4G is great for data transmissions on our phones and other devices, but 5G allows us to connect to automobiles, drones, and much more. 5G brings us the future we are promised. 5G's integration with 4G. Here you can see how 5G and 4G is compared. 4G has less towers and 5G has more. Users can easily switch from 4G and 5G as they wish. 
phones can also connect to 5G and 4G at the same time. When 5G is established, devices can have faster and control data connection. Three, how do 5G towers work? This is an example of a 5G cell tower. You may already see these around since some cities have them. How do 5G towers work? This is a 5G network architecture. The facility consists of 5G macros, small cells, local servers, and central servers. The servers will connect to 4G as well. The local servers will be connected to the central server. The 5G macro is based on MIMO, which is data transfer and receiving. Four, small cells. This is an example of how a small cell looks like. 5G signals can't go past objects. When the frequency and wavelength is high, it is harder for the signal to pass. Like you can see in this diagram over here, the signal can't go past the trees, therefore the phones don't get the signal. This is why we need small cells. The signal bounces from small cells and makes its way around trees. This way the phones get its signals and these cells are placed differently per carrier. Five, how will 5G change our lives? 5G is used by many states today and four main carriers are Sprint, T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon. 5G in the world, three countries are racing to be the first to unleash 5G. Those are China, South Korea, and the USA. Like I explained before, all of our devices are part of the sub six. Only some countries have launched or scheduled millimeter waves. And those countries are South Korea, Russia, Italy, and North America. IoT is the Internet of Things. IoT is a network of things where things use sensors to act upon each other, such as when your phone tells you that your smartwatch is out of battery, or if your Alexa turns on your bedroom light. But IoT can do much more than this. Like if cars are about to crash, they can sense each other's presence, and lives can be saved. IoT is key in the advancement of 5G. IoT and 5G. 4G can't handle so much IoT, and that's where 5G helps us in. 5G and IoT can together build our future. Here you can see how the home is connected to the automobiles, televisions, and much more. This way, five, this way smart homes can be unleashed. Five ways 5G will affect lives through smart cities, work, transportation, medicine, and virtual spaces. Smart cities. Because of 5G and IoT, our future can assure livability, workability, security, and sustainability. Work. Industrial and commercial work can be more computer-based, and human won't have to do the same work repeatedly. Transportation. Human-made accidents like car accidents and travel can be more efficient and fast. Medicine. People can take less trips to hospitals. Implants can predict strokes, heart attacks, and much more. Virtual spaces. People living in different cities can work together side by side. You can beat a Super Bowl crowd from your sofa at home. 5G's consequences. 5G has a frequency that can be harmful to humans. Many people are protesting for the stop of 5G. This is why its launch is delayed. Six, conclusion. 5G is a fifth generation of wireless networks. 5G's foundations are millimeter waves, small cells, massive MIMO, beam forming, and full duplex. 5G differs from 4G, 3G, 2G, 1G, and Wi-Fi. 5G has much faster speeds and more bandwidth. 5G architecture consists of a central server, local servers, 4G and 5G macros and small cells. Since higher frequency can go through objects, small cells help bounce around the signal around objects. IoT and 5G can help do smart cities, work, transportations, health, and virtual spaces.
Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Shivy, for that amazing presentation on 5G. It was very insightful, and I'm sure that everyone learned something new. Now, if anyone in the audience has any questions, please type them in the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll wait like maybe like one more, uh, um, I'll wait for a bit more time and see if anyone has any questions. Okay, our first question is, can IoT work with 4G? Um, okay, 4G is not as strong and it can't help so much with IoT. IoT now is pretty small compared to what it will be in the future. So no, 4G is not the best, and that's why we need 5G. Thank you for that answer. And uh, the next question is, what does GBPS mean? Um, gigabit, um, gigabits per seconds. Um, basically, that's how bandwidth is measured. Bandwidth is um, the range of the range of frequencies, you could say. Okay. And uh, another question is, what are the long-term health side effects in case of 5G, in the cases of 5G waves? Um, I can't say that exactly, but um, a lot of radiation is harmful to our bodies. Like if you have x-rays, you have to wear protective stuff. And um, 5G has really high frequencies that can be harmful to us. OK. And um... The next question is, uh, someone's asking if you can give an example of IoT. Um, I did give a couple of examples. IoT is basically like when things are connected um, with, with a signal or a sensor. Like you could say maybe when you're, um, if you have like a Google Home device or anything and it connects to your light, that is an example of IoT. Okay, and um, the next question is, how do we know which G we are using? Um, okay, on your phones or any other device in the top right corner, it should say something called LTE. That usually means that you have 4G. Um, there can be some conned ones, phones, but most of the time when it says that, it means you're using 4G. Okay, uh, we'll, uh, we'll only do a couple more questions. There are a lot, maybe like one or two more. Uh, the next question is, will 5G be more secure? I believe they're asking in terms of like the security and safety, and like privacy wise. Okay, 5G is pretty much, you could say secure, but IoT is proven to not be because if people hack into even one part, they can get into the whole mainframe so IoT is not one of the most safest, but I think pe people are working on it, so. Okay, and the last question is, do the internet service providers have anything to do with IoT and 5G? Um, no, I haven't done research on that. I can't answer that question. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know there are a lot of questions, but we only have so much time, so we're gonna wrap this up. And our next person, Uh, yeah, so thank you, Shavi, for that presentation. Our next uh, presenter is Deekshit Dinesh Kumar. He will be presenting about the different kinds of um, energies, and he is from Massachusetts. Take it away, Deekshit. Hello everybody, my name is Deekshit Dinesh Kumar and let me introduce myself. So I'm Deekshit Dinesh Kumar and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts and I'm in sixth grade. So today we're gonna to be talking about what is um, like energy, the different types of energy plants, the principles behind these energy plants and how they generate power. So first we're gonna be discussing what is energy, the fundamentals of energy and the law of conservation of energy. So before we go on with the presentation, I'm just going to list some terms that you're going to know for this presentation. So first, generator. Generator is a machine that converts mechanical energy into electricity. Turbine, a device with an enclosed chamber with a vane fitted to a rotary shaft. 
and moderator, a closed chamber where the nuclear reactions take place. So these, these terms are going to come in play for the subsequent slides. So first, let's start off with what is energy? Well, energy is nothing but the ability or capacity to do work. Well, it may exist in potential thermal, electrical, chemical, or any other various forms. For example, it may, in order to cook food, we need heat energy. And in order to drive to school, I need a car or bus, which uses mechanical energy. And I even need some kind of energy to jump in the air. So now let's move on to the law of conservation of energy. Well, the law of conservation of energy states that energy can neither be created nor be destroyed, but can be transformed from one form to another. For example, if I have heat energy, I cannot create it or destroy it, but I can change the form. It is also known as the first law of thermodynamics. So, like, what are the types of energy plants? Well, we're going to be studying chemical energy, nuclear energy, wind energy, thermal energy, and hydraulic energy. There are many, many more different types of energies, for example, electromagnetic energy, sonic energy, gravitational energy, ionization energy, and geothermal energy. But due to time constraints, I'm going to emphasize on these major energy plants. So first, for the subsequent slides, we're going to be discussing how the power plants work in producing the various energy types and how the transformations take place. So first, let's start off with chemical energy. Well, chemical energy is produced from a chemical reaction. For example, we can take a dry cell. Well, a dry cell is made up of a chemical composition, including the anode and cathode. This results in a chemical reaction, which gives electricity. Another example is the matchstick box. Well, when striking the matchstick to the side of the matchbox, it gives heat and light energy. So, and dry cells play a vital role in daily life. We use them in our mobile phones, TV remotes, gaming controllers, and even flashlights. So now let's move on to nuclear energy. Well, nuclear energy is the energy produced from nuclear reactions. For example, we can take the nuclear plants used in the United States, which are mainly used for producing electricity. Well, the nuclear energy produces massive amounts of heat. So the nuclear reactions are usually take place in a closed and secure chamber called the moderator, as I mentioned before. Well, the nuclear reactions give massive amounts of heat energy, so they need some kind of protection. So, while well, during the nuclear reaction, it produces abundant amounts of heat energy. This heat is used to convert water into steam. The steamed kinetic energy is used to be injected into a turbine, which powers the generator. This results in electricity. And nuclear energy is a really efficient way to make energy. Well, in just one nuclear reaction, you get massive amounts of electricity. So it is a great way to produce electricity, right? Well, although it's very efficient, well, it's hazardous to the humankind and other living kind if there's even a small leak. So it is highly dangerous. So now let's be talking about the hydraulic energy. Well, the hydraulic energy is produced from the pressure of water at high altitudes, usually stored at a reservoir or dam. So having this stored at a high altitude like this is going to have a very large amount of kinetic energy while traveling down. Well, the water here stored at this reservoir on the right-hand side has been stored at this reservoir. Well, this water is then transmitted into this pipe called the penstock. Well, this water eventually rotates the turbine blades. Well, the purpose of the turbine blades is to convert the water, the water kinetic energy from the high altitudes of water into a rotary motion. Well, this turbine powers the generator, which produces electricity. This type of energy is a renewable source, which means there's been none harm done to its natural source, which is water. As you can see here, there's been none harm done to it. The water has just been water because the energy source is only getting the kinetic energy of the water at high altitudes to produce electricity. So it's a renewable source. 
Well, although it is a renewable source, we cannot completely rely on this energy source because it depends on rainfall. Well, what does it ma well, why does it matter, you ask? Well, without rainfall, you're not going to produce high amounts of electricity because this energy is based on the water, water pressure. Well, if it's, a ver if it's a very sunny time and it's a drought, well, you're not going to be producing much electricity with this type of energy. So now let's move on to wind energy. Well, wind energy is the result of kinetic energy from the wind used for electricity. Well, the kinetic energy from the wind is used to rotate the turbine blades, which is connected to a generator. This generator converts the kinetic energy from the wind into mechanical from energy. the wind is used to this rotate the turbine be blades to turn into electricity, which is connected to a generator. Specific tasks this such generator as converts the kinetic from energy from the wind well, into mechanical from from the the water into mechanical the left hand side you can see this used to this can later be used to turn into a water which is connected to a generator from water from this generator that mechanical kinetic energy and it later stores it in the water into mechanical the left hand side you can see this used to this can well this is way also which is kinetic energy well how well just like the hydraulic energy there's been none harm done to its natural source which is wind well, the wind is just wind. It is only using the kinetic energy of the wind to produce electricity. Well, although it is a renewable source, it, it cannot be completely relied on. This, this is because the kinetic energy from the wind can only produce low amounts of energy. Well, this is why it is not sufficient source of energy as it does not be able to power at a larger scale. So now let's move on to thermal energy. Well, this type of energy is produced from heat energy reflecting the temperature between two systems. For example, we can take the steam engine, this picture on the left-hand side. Well, the steam engine is powered by burning coal. Well, while burning coal, you get heat. Well, this heat is transmitted into a boiler, which converts water into steam, which is injected into a piston. This lets the locomotive use the mechanical energy to move. Well, another example of thermal energy is the thermal power plant, as you see right here, which uses energy from burning lignite or coal. Well, this, this heat is used to transmit it into water into steam. This steam is then transmitted into a turbine, which generates electricity. Well, this energy is not commonly used now because it can cause pollution by releasing harmful greenhouse gases. Well, the greenhouse gases include methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. These gases can damage the ozone layer, so it is really dangerous for Earth. And you might like recognize a pattern here. Well, they all end in with like the turbine and the process. Well, it's kind of the same. It's just using a different source. For example, the nuclear energy uses the nuclear reaction to produce electricity. Well, thermal energy uses the heat from burning lignite or coal for producing energy. And the hydraulic energy uses the water pressure. They all use different types of sources, but the output is usually the same. So now let's move on to solar energy. Well, solar energy is produced from the heat energy from the sun's ray and converted into electricity. Well, this solar panel is a renewable source, well, which means it, is, it does not harm the natural source during the process of generating energy because it only uses the sun's ray to produce electricity. There's been none harm done to its natural source. Well, this, is, this can also be very beneficial as it reduces electricity bills and the maintenance cost is low. Well, despite the fact it is very efficient for electricity, as it is not only renewable, it can reduce electricity bills and the maintenance cost is low, it also has a lot of demerits. Well, one reason is that the cost and energy storage is high, but the main reason is that it cannot be relied on because it's weather dependent. For example, if you're in a very cold and place where the sun is not visible at times, well, it is not going to be beneficial as it cannot be producing that much electricity. 
Well, if you are, on the other hand, if you're on a very sunny place where the sun is always visible, you're going to produce high amounts of electricity with this. So it would be very beneficial. So now let's move on to the most efficient power plants. Well, the most efficient power plants are going to be the ones that we, are, that we were just talking about. Well, the most efficient power plants are going to be categorized either by if they're renewable, the setup and maintenance cost, and how much they generate power. Well, the hydrothermal, tidal, and wind, and solar are renewable because they've been done, done ha no harm to its environment or its natural source. For example, the hydraulic, there's been none harm done to the water. The water is just water after the process of producing electricity. It is only using the kinetic energy of the water at high altitudes to produce electricity. In terms of maintenance, the wind energy and the solar panels require low maintenance because it is easy to set up and the, the, ma the maintenance cost is low because the wind turbines, well, they require no extra cost, which it's wind, which wind is its source. So it requires no extra cost. Well, now let's talk about the nuclear power plant, which is also very powerful, and the output from this is abundant. But it is also the cleanest source because it doesn't emit no greenhouse gases. So it's pretty convenient because the greenhouse gases are very dangerous to our environment. Well, although it is the cleanest source, again, it is very hazardous if there's only a tiny leak. It would be hazardous to humankind and other living kind. So next, the Morden power plants. Well, the Morden power plants are going to be, well, being researched or being used just today. Well, let's start off with the ocean power plant or the tidal power plant, which generates electricity from the energy of the waves. Sounds like a great idea, right? Because it is. Well, one reason is that it's unlimited, economical, and clean. Well, how is it unlimited? Well, well, Earth is covered in three-fourths of water, which means that waves are very abundant. And it's also economical because the initial setup isn't that high. And how is it clean? Well, it's a renewable source. There's been none. Um, harm done to its natural source, which is water. It is only using the kinetic energy from the ocean waves to produce electricity. Well, although it's unlimited, economical, and clean, it can also be very high amounts of energy for the setup cost and maintenance cost. Well, how? Well, to set it up in the middle of the ocean, it's going to require a lot of money. And the maintenance cost is really high. If there's a damage done to this, you need to pay really high costs. And you're going to need money to bring back the energy from like from the power plant, which is in the middle of the ocean back to land, which is going to require a lot of money. So now let's move on to geothermal energy power plants, which are still being used today. Well, the geothermal energy power plant, well, it's by drilling a deep hole onto the Earth's core and bringing back the Earth's core's heat energy. As you all know, the Earth's core is hotter than on the sun, so it's going to have a lot of heat energy. This heat energy can later be used to convert into electricity, which can, which can power cities and other places. Well, it is also dangerous because it releases harmful gases into the air. So now let's move on to the beta-volatic devices. And trust me, people, it is really great and it's an interesting topic. So let's have a recap on one power plant. Remember that nuclear power plant which uses radioactive material to produce electricity? Well, after a certain time, well, the radioactive material decays or dies. So it has to be disposed of in a safely manner. Well, the beta-volatic devices uses that dead radioactive material and uses the remaining energy to power and turn into electricity. Well, it sounds like a great idea. You're just recycling different types of energy power plants. Well, you're using that remaining radioactive material, which is hazardous to humankind because it's toxic, and using it as a new energy source. So it sounds like a great idea, right? Yeah, it is. So, and here in the bottom, you can see a pictures of the tidal power plants, which, re which look really cool. You can see all like the, the waves coming in to produce electricity. And you might notice something, all of them, they're really, you might look at them, they all have merits and demerits. So there's no way of choosing the best power plant. 
well. And also, let's have a quick recap on everything we learned today. So first, I talked about how the energy plants like, how the energy and the fundamentals of energy and the law of conservation of energy. Then we talked about like the demerits, the principles behind the different types of energy plants and how they generated power. So now we talked about the most efficient ones categorized by either if they were renewable at like and by its cost and it was all great and now we talked about the modern power plants which were really interesting so it was pretty much good so now any questions thank you Dixit, for that amazing presentation so now if anyone in the audience has any questions please type them in the chat okay so the first question is can you mix these different kinds of like energies together? Well, if you're going to mix it, there's not going to be an exact creation because mixing these different types of energy sources into one, because you're going to eventually convert it into one type of energy if it's electricity. So you could mix it and combine it, but it is all going to be the same in the end. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what is the most common type of energy to use? Well, the nuclear energy power plant is very commonly used right now. And also the hydraulic energy, it's also kind of common, but the rest are not being used as much because some of them are like dangerous to our environment. But the solar panels, they are very, very beneficial to, um, and to the environment. And it helps like for humankind as it just, it doesn't like harm the environment in any way. Great. So the next question is, are some of these sources more harmful to um, uh, animals and plants than like other kinds of sources? Well, the most like dangerous one would be the radioactive material or like from the nuclear power plant and also the thermal power plant, which really pollute, like really like damage like animals and plants and our like atmosphere. So those like those are really dangerous to the environment and it wouldn't be recommended to use, but to produce electricity, the nuclear power plant is efficient, but it is also at the same time hazardous. If there's like a tiny leak, it could end up in a, like, it's really dangerous. Okay. Yeah. Again, we have a lot of questions. I'm only going to um, ask you one or two more. So the next one is, um, which, uh, so would the tidal power plant potentially harm any like aquatic life? Um, no, um, based on my research, well, it's, it's not going to harm any other aquatic animals because it's only using the kinetic energy from the waves. So it's only like going to use it as a turbine. But if animals get in the way of it, it can harm. But people are trying to find like scientists are tr like almost trying to find a better way to produce electricity with this tidal power plant. Okay. Uh, and the last question is, are there any downfalls in the quality of the drinking water after it is used in like uh, dams? Well, there's going to be no, uh, like the quality is still going to be good. Like, as I said, it's a renewable source, so it's still going to be drinkable. It's, it's just using the kinetic energy after the turbine. So it's still going to be drinkable and there's going to be no changes done like to the um, water. Thank you, Dixit, for that amazing presentation. Um, and next up is Salmut. Salmut is from Virginia and he will be presenting about invasive species. You can uh, start. Hi, my name is Salmit Gurguntla. And my name is Sanjana Gurguntla. Today we're going to be talking about invasive species and what impact they can do to the environment. Now let's start. What are invasive species? Invasive species are species that are brought out of their native land. This happens through human impact. When this human impact occurs, it is very dangerous and harmful to the ecosystem. The first invasive creature we're going to talk about are the Burmese pythons. 
What made Burmese pythons invasive species? Burmese pythons are snakes that are from Asia, but a person took one of these snakes as a pet. The snake he took grew way too big and he released it into the Everglades, which made a huge impact on the web. This is why we shouldn't do these actions in the first place. Why are Burmese pythons considered invasive creatures? They eat species that are apex predators. They came from another ecosystem. Last but not least, they are affecting the food web in the Everglades. More facts about Burmese pythons. In their native place, which is in Asia, they have natural predators in their native land. When they came to the Everglades, they have no natural predators, so they reproduce and affect the ecosystem. This is harmful to the ecosystem. A very cool fact is that Burmese pythons have swallowed alligators, which is an apex predator in the Everglades. Another awesome fact is that Burmese pythons can tangle panthers, which are apex predators. Since they have no predators, they eat and eat and they soon explode. What can we do to stop affecting the food web? Don't bring any animals to other places. Think about the consequences while doing the action, not only about this topic, but in life, think first, then act. If you don't care about this, you're going to be one to be blamed for this action. Fun facts about Burmese pythons. Number one, Burmese pythons are one of the largest snakes in the world. They are in the top five largest snakes. Number two, they are 23 feet in length. That is why they're one of the top five largest snakes. Number three, they weigh 200 pounds with a girth as big as a telephone pole. Well, that is a lot of weight for a snake. Number four, when Burmese pythons are young, they spend most of their time in trees. Number five, they are excellent swimmers. Finally, they are not venomous at all, but they can still bite, so you still don't want to get bit by one. Wow. Those are some awesome facts we learned, but now let's move on. The next invasive um, species we're going to talk about is the mongoose. What made mongoose invasive species? Mongoose were brought to Hawaii from India to kill rats because in Hawaii, rats were a big issue. But when the mongoose were brought, they couldn't kill the rats because they are day animals and rats are nocturnal. So they reproduced and created chaos in Hawaii. Why are mongoose invasive species? The small Indian mongoose has had a major impact on native species in the area where it has been introduced. When this species spread to Hawaii, things weren't as good for the mongooses. In most cases, the native wildlife in these areas evolved in the absence of predatory mammals, so they are particularly threatened by mongoose predation. This is the reason why mongoose are considered as invasive species. What impact has a mongoose made? Mongooses have been implicated in the decline of many bird, reptile, and even mammal species. It has declined many species and have distracted people in their daily lives. Now it's fun fact time about mongooses. Mongooses have many awesome talents that most species can't do, like killing the cobra. They also have awesome immunity power to withstand the venom. There are 33 mongoose species that live in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Another cool fact about mongooses is that they can easily adapt to places that they go to. That is why they are not endangered at all. Last but not least, mongooses are carnivores and they are weasel-like creatures. Opinion against mongooses. Opinion against mongooses in Hawaii are very, very harsh. When I was researching about mongooses, a person said that mongooses are nasty and they do attack cats. That is why cats leave. That's because cats are scared that mongoose will bite their tail off. They came here for a purpose to kill rats, but they can't because rats are nocturnal and mongoose are only awake only in daytime. So if they have no purpose here in Hawaii, what, what's the point of even staying? Another reason they are really hated is that they cause chaos in daily life. 
But in India, they think the opposite. Whenever they see a mongoose, they think they are lucky because they can be protected from uh, protected from snakes. Those are some awesome, cool facts. But now let's move on. Now let's talk about another invasive species, the red fox. Why are red foxes considered as invasive species? First off, in Australia, a lot of creatures were getting affected by human impact. One creature that was endangered was the red fox. So since the red fox was endangered, they brought the red fox to North America. This was actually a bad idea because they started affecting the food up just like other invasive species. Fun facts about red foxes. Now let's start. Red foxes would not just be great, but amazing triathletes. Triathletes are basically athletes. Number two, their tail is over half their body. Red foxes' bodies are usually one and a half feet up to three feet long. That means their tail, tails are really long. Next, red foxes' forepaws have five toes, but their hind feet only have four. That's so cool. Number four, red foxes have supersonic hearing. Well, almost. They can hear crows in flight from up to a third mile away, a goose changing roost at 600 paces, and even a little mouse squeak from 100 meters away. Reportedly, they can even hear a watch ticking from 40 yards away. That, that is a really good um, like feature. Number five, did you know that when red foxes are afraid, they grin? Well, that's amazing. Number six, female red foxes are, call, are called vixens. Next, they do not make good pets. Animals that live in the wild are better in the wild than in your house. Finally, a fox's den is normally a burrow underground, also known as an earth. But they can also live above ground in a cozy hollow. How do red fox affect the environment? Foxes are considered as pest animals. This means they affect a lot just like pests. They threaten native wildlife in the ecosystem. They also have been a cause of many species extinction. Last but not least, they also threaten lo local livestock, including poultry and lambs. Opinion against red foxes. Many people don't like red foxes. Here's why. The red fox contributes to the spread of disease due to the widespread nature of its range and resistance to population control methods. It could additionally be a key carrier of rabies were this disease ever to be first introduced to Australia. The red fox also threatens local livestock due to predation. So most people don't like red foxes, but some people actually do. Here's why. The red fox's resourcefulness has earned it a legendary reputation for intelligence and its cunning attitude. That is quite amazing. Now we know that many people like and dislike red foxes. Why was the red fox a threat to the United States of America? The red fox contributes to the spread of lots of diseases. One disease it carries is rabies. This happens to the, due to the widespread of nature of its range and its resistance to population control methods. It could additionally be a key, a key carrier of rabies were that disease to ever be introduced to Australia. It, like, like I said before, it also has declined many species population and threatens, threatens people in their daily lives and causes chaos. Thank you for listening to our speech. Do your part in helping the ecosystem. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Great job, Samit and Sanjana. So um, now if anyone has any questions, please type them in the chat. Uh, so the first question is, what is a grouse? 
Oh, it's um, it's it's a it's a type of sound. So basically, it's pronounced grooves. So yeah. Um, and the next question is: Are these kinds of animals dangerous to um mankind? Um, they sort of are, but like they affect the ecosystem and um. And, but they just like distract people in their daily lives. So they can be harmful, but um, they're mostly not. Uh, okay. And the next question is, why were the foxes endangered to begin with? Um, because in Australia, um, um, in Australia, um, deforestation was happening. So um, foxes were uh, endangered and... Um, they wanted to bring the foxes to another environment, so they brought the foxes to North America. Okay. And the next question is, is there a law to protect these, um, uh, these like invasive species? Um, or like, or like any laws around them? Um, they, they have like some laws, but um, they can they're not strict um followed because it um those plans are not working so what most people are doing um is that they're trying to like kill these poor invasive species okay thank you and once again thank you for presenting samit and sanjana um so i hope you all are learning something new and you can find more details at stemfairs.com about future events and links to sign up as a presenter or as an audience member. And the next event uh, is on July 11th and the one after is on August 9th. So the next presenter is Arya. So Arya, you can start presenting. A voyage to the International Space Station. So first, what is the ISS? The International Space Station is a space station that, in the lower, that is located in the lower orbit of Earth. It is a collaborative project between five different countries and their space agencies. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, from the United States, Roscosmos from Russia, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency from Japan, the Canadian, the Canadian Space Agency from Canada, and the European Space Agency from a number of different countries in Europe, including the United Kingdom, France, and Ireland. It is mainly used for performing science experiments in space. There are usually only six astronauts on board the station at once, and they generally switch out every six months so that no astronaut is in space for too long. The International Space Station is di always dipping down through the atmosphere, and to make sure that it doesn't burn up, in doing so, the scientists have to periodically lift the station back into lower orbit. So here's just a general timeline of the ISS, and this is just noting the main events from when it was first created to now. So on January 25th, 1984, President Ronald Reagan, Reagan's State of the Union Address directed NASA to build an international space station within the next 10 years. On November 20th, 1998, the first segment of the ISS launched and it was a Russian Proton's rocket named Zarya. On December 4th, 1998, Unity, the first US built component of the International Space Station was launched. On November 2nd, 2000, the astronaut Bill Shepard and cosmonauts Yuri Gidenzo and Sergei Kreklev became the first crew to reside on board the station, sharing, staying for several months. On February 7th, 2001, Destiny, the US laboratory module became part of the station and Destiny continues to be the primary research laboratory for US payloads. 
On February 7, 2008, Europe became the European Space Agency's Columbus Laboratory became part of the station, which meant that they had properly joined the ISS. And on, in 2008, March 11, 2008, the first Japanese Kibo Laboratory module became part of the station. And lastly, in, around 20, 2013, the first ISS National Lab research flight was launched. And it was launched because they found a way to grow to grow proteins as crystals within space. And these would be used to create a lot of medical drugs that would save lives. Did you know that China was banned from the International Space Station because they seemed incapable of pursuing space travel? Although they proved that they could handle space exploration at eventually, they, end, they ultimately were permanently banned from the ISS in 2011 because they were not trusted by the people in the ISS political wise. So here's just a general overview diagram of the ISS. And in the next few slides, I'm gonna go a little bit in more depth and talk about all of the modules as well as all the other parts. And one thing I wanna point out before I do that, this side of the ISS is considered mainly Russian. So it belongs to all the Russian people and this side and the Russian space agency and this side is belongs to the other four in the, in the, that are involved with the ISS, which is Japan, the US, Canada, as well as all those European countries. And lastly, this whole ISS is, is estimated to be the size lengthwise of a football field, which is very large. So here's just a few of the main modules and these are put in order from when they were first put into the station. So Zarya, which is also known as the functional cargo block was first was the first launch module of the ISS and it was Russian and it was primarily used for storage. The next one is the unity module, which is also known as node one. It is cylindrical and it has, it, it was built for NASA by Boeing for the U S and essential space station resources, such as fluids, environmental control, life support systems, electrical and data systems are routed through Unity to supply work and living areas of the station. Svedzda is another Russian module and it provides all of the station's life support systems for all of the modules. The Destiny Laboratory module, also known as the US Lab, was constructed by Boeing and it allows for tests in the absence of gravity. The Harmony module, which is also known as Node 2, is also American. It's cylindrical and it acts as a passageway to international science labs and cargo spacecrafts between those nodes. The Columbus Orbital Facility is another, is another science laboratory, but it's mainly used for the European Space Agency. And the Japanese Experiment module, which is also known as Kibo, is the largest module on the entire on the entire ISS and it is used for experiments in space. So the next part I wanted to talk about was the integrated truss structure and it's essentially the backbone of the station and it holds the solar arrays to generate electricity, radiator panels that remove heat from the station as well as other equipment and it's kind of like the spine of the entire station and it's kind of the glue that holds the entire station together. So here are just some of the statistics um, related to its size. So the actual ISS is 257 feet in length, about 925,000 pounds in weight and 254 miles tall. So as you can tell, it's very big. These are just some fun facts about the ISS. So the ISS travels five miles per second, and that means that the station circles the entire planet once every 90 minutes. The ISS is the single most expensive object ever built. The cost of the ISS has been estimated at over $120 billion. This includes all of the payments that all of the countries made from now all the way from 
the beginning of the ISS all the way to present date, and that number is only growing. There are only two bathrooms on the entire station, and the urine of both the crew members and the laboratory animals is filtered back into the station's drinking water supply for efficiency. Because when you're in space, you need to be efficient with how you hold your, your resources. Last, and currently, the ISS is the third brightest object in the night sky after the moon and Venus. And this is not because it is super bright or anything like that. It is mainly because, like I said before, it is pretty close to Earth and it's located in low Earth orbit. Other satellites are, are in the upper atmosphere, so they are much further away. And other stars and other planets obviously are a lot further away. So just because the International Space Station is a lot closer, that means that it will be one of the brightest objects in the sky. So what will happen in the ISS in the future? So the ISS will eventually be worn down to the point where, un where it's unsafe for the astronauts. And at that point, they would need to deorbit the space station. NASA also spends over $4 billion every year to operate the ISS, and their current budget ends in 2024. They want to do more exciting missions for the future, and deorbiting the space station is the first step towards that. When they decide to retire the space station, they will have the challenging task of having to remove the space station from space in a safe way. According to the Outer Space Treaty, each country is legally responsible for their own modules and will have to deorbit their own modules themselves. Although many have suggested that we bring back the space station back to Earth piece by piece and make a museum out of the parts, this is incredibly unlikely because it would take hundreds of missions to bring them all down, not to mention that the technology has not been invented to bring down all of the parts of the space station, as it was constructed in space. The most probable way for the space station to be deorbited is for it to be sent into an area in the Pacific Ocean called Point Nemo. This is the safest way for them to deorbit the station because the nearest human life is extremely far away and the actual nearest human life is actually the ISS circling above it in space. Other than that, NASA also wanted other private companies to take over the space station or even make a new one. Although this seems like a very good idea, this is highly unlikely because other space stations are not really profitable yet. SpaceX and other private companies need a way to sustain themselves as they are not funded by the government. Lastly, NASA wants to make a lunar space station at some point within the near future at around 2028. They can, by doing this, they can perform experiments here out of the Earth's magnetic field, and they can also send other vehicles on longer explorations as they will be closer to other planets. This is also where they plan to send the first humans over to Mars. Credits, and then thanks for watching. Any questions? Thank you, Arya, for that amazing presentation about the ISS. So um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, please type them in the chat. Uh, so the first question is, how much is the international space system like cost? Like, yeah, so, for, uh, for all the parts and to install it. So the the price of it like i said before was around 120 billion dollars which included all of the materials the and the actual building of it and hiring the people to build it and they fun fact they built it in space because it's a lot harder to bring things into space if they are heavier and the price is or it's its price is constantly getting greater because every year each Space Agency has to spend thousands of billions of dollars, billions of dollars in order to keep it running. Okay. And what's the size of the international space system and the functions of it? Okay. So the size was here. It's 
Th these are just the dimensions of it. It's 257 feet long, around 925,000 pounds and 254 miles. And basically its usage is NASA and other countries wanted to see how certain things would react outside of Earth and outside of gravity field. So in, in creating the space station, for, they can test certain things to see how they react. For example, I know recently they've been growing plants and other things in space to see how they react without gravity. And Okay. And the next question is, can, uh, can different countries also join the international space system? So I'm not exactly sure, but I'm relatively sure that countries can join if they, you know, if they ask to join, but obviously certain countries have been banned just because they weren't trusted. Like I said, China was also banned. So, yeah. and they also need to have a, um, a proper space, space exploration government funded company. They can't just join without proper equipment and experience. Okay, so the last question is, after the international space system will be deorbited, are there any other plans or like what's going to take the place of that? Wait, can you repeat that? Um, after the international space system is deorbited and it's like brought back into the, uh, um, um, and it's brought back at Point Nemo, is there going to be something like, it, um, something that's going to like go in place of that instead? Or is there going to be like no like things like that to take place yeah. of the international space system. Yeah, so this is not the only space station. So first of all, Russia is going to take is there's a chance that Russia is going to take all of their modules and make their own space station because they wanted their own national space station. And like I said before, NASA wants to create another lunar space station. And in, instead of being close to Earth, it's going to be closer to the moon. And other countries obviously are going to have to make different space stations. And I'm very sure that in the near future, there will be another international space station for all countries to join. Okay. Thank you, Arya, for that amazing presentation. And you can. So I just want to say one thing before we continue. Um, uh, I, uh, so I saw that there were like different, like, um, different, like, uh, drawings on the presentation. And I would just like to say, please do not like, uh, make those drawings on the presentation. It's extremely like disrespectful to what the presenters have done so far. So I believe I have found that person and I have taken them out of the zoom call, but I just want to say, um, yeah, please do not uh, continue to make annotations. That's all. So, uh, our next presenter is, uh, Dave Mansinga. He will be presenting about Lego EV3 Robotics. Take it away, Dev. Um, okay, hello, my name is Dev, and today I'm presenting about Lego EV3 Robotics. So first, let's start off by talking about LEGO EV3 as a whole. There are many different robots to build in EV3 robotics. LEGO Mindstorm's EV3 Home Edition is one of the main apps that's usually used for programming the robot. You can use the EV3 Home Edition app to program the robot, or you can program the robot itself on, um, the, on the intelligent brick. Today, the robot that I will be presenting is called the Tracker. So let's start off by talking about the key components and sensors in EV3. So the first one is the large motor. This helps the robot to move and make turns. The medium motor is what helps um, the tool connected to the robot function smoothly. The color sensor is what is, uh, has the ability to sense seven different types of colors. The infrared sensor, or also known as the IR sensor, is the eye of the robot. It can measure the distance from any other object that is close to the robot. The touch sensor can detect when it's pressed or released. The IR beacon is like the remote control of the robot. It works only with the IR sensor plugged into the brain. 
So now let's talk about the intelligent brick. This is the one of the most important things in EV3. So the intelligent brick is the heart and brain of the robot. It has four different ports for four ports for motors and four ports for sensors. You can connect the brick to your PC with a USB cable or using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Programming the bot on the intelligent brick is possible, which I was talking about earlier in the first slide. So now let's start off by talking about the robot I will be presenting today, the tracker. The tracker is one of the most basic robots in EV3. It was basically just designed to move around, but you can also do other things with it. To do these other things, you just have to build the right attachment that you want to do and connect it to the medium motor, as you can see in the middle picture. So once you connect the attachment to the medium motor, it, you can just program the robot and it, it should do what you want it to do. Now let's talk about the main parts of the robot. The one of the main parts is Legos because that's what it's made out of. And it also has two large motors. The large motor is what helps the um, robot to move. The one medium motor is what um, helps the bot to be functional and um, follow the instructions based on the tools you have built. The IR sensor and the color sensor are there for the enhancement of the robot. The mission pad, as you can see over here, is what the challenges or the missions are done on. The mission pad does come with the EV3 set. Now, let's talk about programming in EV3. Programming in EV3 is very, very easy. It's just a drag and drop software. You can program um, the EV3 robot using the Home Edition app on any device with the software installed, and you can also do it on the brick. After building the robot, you can use your software to start programming, and once you have done that, you can upload your um, code on the brick using a USB cable or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, like I said earlier. The blocks in the EV3 um, software are sorted into sections, so it's easier to find them. As you can see over here, this is a blank page of the um, EV3 Home Edition programming. This um, sign over here is basically where you just attach and connect all the blocks. All your current projects are shown on the top of the screen over here. The, um, this thing down over here is where you can um, see what bricks you have connected to your computer and you can upload them using this button. And like I said earlier in the last slide, this um, over here is the, are the sections in which the blocks are divided into. The green section is action, the orange is flow control, the yellow section is sensors, the red section is data operations, blue is for advanced, and the light blue over here is my block. Now let's finally get on to the missions in the EV3 Home Edition app that were given to me after I finished building the um, tracker. So there were five different missions. Let's start off by talking about the first one. As you can see over here, in the first mission, the bot uh, uses this bi-blade blender. In this mission, the bot goes towards the tire. Then the bi-blade blender turns on and the tire in front of the robot is sweeped away. Then the robot returns back to its starting position and makes a fanfare sound to end the mission. As you can see over here on the right, this picture is a picture of the program that, was, uh, that I made to complete this mission. And this, I'm just gonna go through this really quick. This block over here is like the screen display, which changes the way the robot, um, the robot, the brick screen display looks. In this one, it makes the robot pinch left, which makes it like look left. And then the robot goes forward around a little. And then the medium motor turns on. And when the medium motor turns on, the bi-blade blender rotates. So that's what I was talking about when I say that it helps the attachment to be functional. Then the large motor over here turns back and goes towards its starting position. And then finally, the sound block makes a fanfare sound. Let's watch a short video on how this robot completes the mission.
Okay, so as you saw, that was how the robot successfully completes its mission. Let's move on to the second mission, the blasting bazooka. In this mission, the robot turns towards one of the tires and then shoots at it using the blasting bazooka and the tire and the, uh, these red small balls over here, they hit the tire. Then the robot turns towards the other stack of tires and then shoots at it with the blasting bazooka twice this time. And when the tire falls off, the robot turns back towards the center and makes a laughing sound. Let's watch a short video on this mission now. All right, so as you saw, Rob did all the steps that I told that it was going to do. This page is a screenshot of the program of the second mission. So as you see here, it again changes screen display. Then the robot turns towards where the robot had the uh, screen display had changed. And then the media motor rotates. This causes one of the um, things inside the blasting bazooka to rotate, which makes um, the thing shoot. And once it shoots, and hits the tire, then it turns uh, towards the other way, changing its screen display again. And then the media motor turns on again, and then the robot shoots. After that, the screen display changes towards the middle. The robot turns towards the middle and makes a laughing sound to end the challenge. Now, as you can see, the third mission uses this gripper claw thingy over here. In this mission, the robot it goes towards a tire, picks it up using the gripper, and then the robot turns right and places it into one of the squares. Then the robot goes back, repeats it with the second tire, and then the robot turns back and returns to its original position and makes a cheering sound. Let's watch a short video on how the robot completes this mission. Okay, so as you saw, the robot did everything I said, but I forgot to mention that the robot makes like um, uh, air release and air um, a tad kind of sound whenever it picks up and drops uh, one of the tires. This is the code for the third mission using the gripper claw. It kind of, it's kind of long, so I'm just gonna um, shorten it out. First, the... Um, Media motor turns on to pick to put the gripper claw into a picking up position. Then the large motor moves forward. The medium motor picks up the um, medium motor makes the gripper claw pick up the tire. And then what when, when the tire is being picked up, like I said, the robot makes an air brake sound. Then the robot turns right using the large motor. And then the media motor again turns to release the tire this time. And then the robot makes an air release kind of sound. And then the robot, um, after releasing that tire, it drives back and then it repeats this, which is inside this loop over here. And then after this loop has been repeat, it has been repeated with the second tire, the large motor goes back and then it makes a cheering sound to end this off. Mission number four, heavy hammer. In this mission, the bot has a hammer attached to the robot to protect it from back ambushes. The bot moves around crazily, just moves around anything. This mission does not require the mission pad. In this one, the robot is moving around. You can just put something in front of the IR sensor. When the IR sensor senses it, the bot turns around and the hammer smashes. Every time the hammer smashes, after sensing something with the IR sensor, the robot makes a laughing sound. Now, this is a short video on how the robot completes this mission.
All right, so as you saw, the robot turns around every time I put my hand in front of the IR sensor. Believe me, this hammer really does hurt you. You don't want to try this. Now, let's look at the program of this fourth mission. This one's also very long. I'll just uh, summarize it for you. Just as the um, media motor has to um, just move around crazily, and then the robot's going crazy. And then every time the IR sensor senses something, the robot changes its uh, screen display to angry. It turns around using the large motor. And then every time the um, medium motor um, smashes, the robot makes a laughing sound. And then that's how the um, challenge ends up. You can do that fourth mission as many times as you want and the robot will still work. This is mission number five. It requires the IR beacon. The IR beacon, like I said before, is the remote control of the robot. In this mission, you use the Byblade Blender attachment, which is what we used in the first mission. Except in this one, there are more tires on the mission pad, and the robot follows what you do, make it do from the IR beacon. So in this mission, the robot um, starts the Byblade Blender to start off. And then it follows the IR beacon's instructions, which is the beacon is being controlled by me. Then the robot makes a fanfare sound whenever it knocks out the first and third tire. To know that it's knocked out the first and third tire, there's a, um, each tire is placed beneath a color. And then in this one, is this mission is when the color sensor comes in place. Every time the robot knocks out a tire, the color sensor should be sensing these colors. And every time this color is sensed, the first and third tire, uh, whenever that's knocked off, it makes a fanfare sound. In the last you know, tire, the robot makes a cheering sound. The color sensor, like I said, is what's used to detect whatever sound it makes, depending on the um, color the tire is placed on, on. The robot makes an alarm kind of sound every, oh God. Yeah, so the robot makes an alarm kind of sound every time it, the time runs for hitting a tire. Yes, this mission is timed. Now let's look at a video on the fifth mission. Okay, as you said, the robot was following my instructions. Believe me, this mission does get crazy if you're really not a master with controlling the IR beacon. And I'm not, so that's why the mission was kind of crazy. This programming is very, very large. This is a program for the fifth mission. In this one, three things are running at the same time. First, the time trial, which is the timer, uh, is turned on. Then the robot moves. And every um, the robot just turns on the no in this one, the robot turns on the um, Byblade Blender using the medium motor, and then it tells it to follow the instructions that the IR beacon gives it. And again, remember for the IR beacon's instructions to work, the IR sensor has to be plugged into the um, robot's brain. And then, as you see, this third row over here. This third row over here is basically the main row of the programming. This is where the um, robot controls the, is controlled by the IR beacon, and it makes all those fanfare sounds and the alarm going off sounds. And then also, if you, if you watch carefully on the screen display, every time the alarm went off, it changed the, uh, there was like a bar on there that changed it to 25%, then 50, then 75 and then 100% in the last tire. So that was how this mission went. Thank you for watching. Any questions? Thank you um, for that presentation, Dev. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, if you do type it in the chat, please.
Okay, so one question is, is there any virtual simulator to build this robot without necessarily buying the kit? Um, based on my research, I don't think there is, but maybe you can Google search it and figure it out because I did not really search for a virtual simulator. I just went ahead and bought the kit. So I won't be able to answer this question perfectly. Okay. And uh, the next question is what student age or grade would you suggest um, for, um, for the kids and students to use? Um, I would suggest that if you've started like scratch programming or something, you should be able to understand this. And if you've built a, a couple Legos, like just normal ones, this one shouldn't be that hard. You have been instructions in the Home Edition app also gives you instruction for building the robot and the other tools. And it also gives you programming instructions. So any age that knows how to um, operate a computer and use Lego should be able to work with this. Okay. And the next question is, how long did it take you to build this? Um, for me, I was doing this every day since I started building the robot, which is why it didn't take me more than a day or two to finish the to, um, building of the main robot. Then the other attachments I did one day at a time. So it took me around a week or two to finish the all five attachments. Okay. And the last question is, can you use the kit to build different kinds of robots? And can you build your own custom robots? Yes, you can build your own custom robot and you can build any kind of robot using the same kit. You don't need to buy different kits for building. Each kit comes with everything required for building as many robots you want. Okay. And thank you so much, Dev, for presenting. It was a very interesting presentation about LEGO EV3 Robotics. So yeah, next, right, next we have Siddharth presenting about AI and biological intelligence. Siddharth, take it away. Today, I'm going to present artificial intelligence and biological intelligence. I'm a rising sis, sixth grader, and I'm going. And my name is Tetsunkisa. One second. Okay. My introduction. Artificial intelligence is intelligence demonstrated by machines. Artificial intelligence is intelligence demonstrated by, by machines, such as computers, smartphones, smart cars, Alexas, and Google Homes. They are all examples of AI. Biological intelligence, also called natural intelligence, is intelligence demonstrated by humans and animals. Till the 1990s, people have used symbolic AI. I'll explain symbolic AI later. Humans and animals have always used biological intelligence. Now let me talk more about biological intelligence. Biological intelligence makes us function and be the human we are. Knowing that your body is intelligent makes you more intelligent. Biological intelligent makes intelligence makes you more capable and resilient. Artificial intelligence is advancing every day and so are you. Your brain grows each day. It uses neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the growing and learning of the brain. The neural connections in the brain grow. Emotional intelligence, social intelligence, analytical and logical reasoning, and etc. are the effects of biological intelligence. <laughs> Evolution of AI. Symbolic AI is coding explicit code and rules for the network. Symbolic AI was not very intelligent because the rules could not recognize different data points and were not adjusted with the training process. They went in another direction, which was try to mimic natural intelligence. Oh, wait, is the, are the speaker not showing in the presentation? Uh, yes, they're showing. Oh. Oh, so how do I, okay. 
Are they showing now? Yes. Oh yeah. Still Give... Oh, I know how to do it. Never mind. I need to restart sharing. Stop sharing. Now, are they sharing? I mean, yeah, showing. Uh, no, they're not showing anymore. You can continue. Okay. S sorry. Symbolic AI is coding. Let me restart this. Symbolic AI is coding explicit code and rules for the network. It was n not very intelligent because the rules could not recognize different data points and were not adjusted with the training process. So they went in another direction, which was try was to try to mimic natural intelligence. This is achieved by training a network of interconnected layers of neurons. Just like we have neural networks in the brain, AI is trying to make these networks artificially. Training means giving data and telling the network what the data is. They repeat this test millions of times with different data. How do you train a neural network? There are four main aspects to training. In activation function, an activation function is a function that controls what output to activate, just like neurons being stimulated by an electrical impulse in the brain. A loss function, a loss function is a formula to measure how far the AI network is from the expected result. Backpropagation, Backpropagation is to go backwards in a network, adjusting each neuron that is giving bad output to decrease the output amount, lowering the weights, and neurons that are giving good output to increase the output amount, increasing the weight. This action is done millions of times unless you give it a limit or threshold to stop. And GPU, graphical processing unit. GPU is a machine that is capable of running millions of fast operations to train the network. Now let me talk about the differences between the two. The human brain applies logic to what it sees in the vision. The human brain retains what it sees and sees the similarities between things and knows that that's that. Because AI is just a machine, it uses no human logic and just goes through millions of possibilities and sees what works out. So Deep Blue, the AI, beat Gary Kasparov in a chess match. Deep Blue worked out all the possibilities based on the rules of the game. Now let me talk about similarities. And AI networks learn the same way. The parents or teachers tell the baby what the object or thing is. The people who train the network do the same. They both process a lot of data of many things to recognize and learn. Both humans and AI think of all the possibilities and what will happen, but humans to a lower scale. Going back to my previous point, Deep Blue thought of thousands of possibilities and combinations to beat Kasparov, while Kasparov used logic from his previous matches against Deep Blue. An example, convolutional neural networks versus human vision. The human eye. The eye works when the signal of what we see reaches the brain. You see an object because light bounces off the object. The light goes through the cornea, then through the pupil, and via the retina, and goes to the optic nerve, which sends what it sees to the brain. The eye filters what it sees to help it see. The low vision filters help to manage the transmission levels of various light waves, which helps to improve the vision of those with low vision conditions. The eye can, the, both of the eyes can see in, the two eyes together can see in three dimensions. And the human, and humans can see better in the center fovea. The center fovea is the central part of our eyes. Opsins or pigment molecules in retinal cells absorb the electromagnetic, electromagnetic energy from photons and light generating an electrical impulse. That signal travels to the optic nerve to the brain. CNN tried to emulate an eye and use it for bionic eye. Now let me talk about convolutional neural networks. 
They are used to pro process and understand images and videos. In deep learning, a convolutional neural network is a class of deep neural networks, most commonly applied to analyzing visual imagery. CNN uses filters to perform a convolution operation. It's, it uses filters to slice and map the image one by one and learn different portions of the image. Filters help detect features like edges and complex shapes. Just like in an eye, a, in a CNN, certain neurons are activated based on the feature. They have applications in image and video recognition, image classification, medical image analysis, and et cetera. It emulates an eye by focusing on a tiny portion of the image they're looking at, partially blurring out anything else. Here's a picture of a convolutional neural network. This image is of an input going through multiple filters and layers of convolution. The network is picking up features for every subsequent layer the signal goes through till the output. The deeper it goes, the network picks up more complex features, just like the human eye. Comparison between the two. <laughs> Human and animal vision is a complex system that evolved over millions of years. Artificial vision cannot equal biological vision in size or complexity. Though less complex, the CNN can be trained to do intelligent tasks in image processing. But CNNs also have limitations. Pooling layers can eliminate important features. These CNNs are flawed because when they see a picture of a face, with a mouth, two eyes, and nose. Even when the face has the parts in the wrong areas, it shows the high probability that it's a face because of all the parts. The eye is better at telling the worksmanship of something. That means the eye can see if there's a huge scratch or dent in an object, but a CNN just thinks of the object as regular with no scratch or dent because of the shape and size. Most importantly, Humans and animals use logic and related knowledge when looking at things. Applications of AI. You can use AI for speech and, speech and voice recognition, like Alexa, Siri, and Google Homes. AI can be used in face recognition for law enforcement and the government. Tesla, Volvo, many car companies make self-driving cars that use object identification, image processing, motion detection, and much more. They can even do tasks that require intelligence. For example, they can take the place of a radiologist. Research, researchers at Seoul National University in South Korea developed an AI algorithm called DLAD, Deep Learning Based Automatic Detention detection to analyze chest radiographs. The AI outperformed the doctors in analyzing chest radiographs. The reason is because AIs work at a pixel level and they can pull out features that are latent features that the human that humans can't see. Conclusion. AI and biological intelligence are interesting and complex topics. I only scratch the surface with what I said today. There's much more out there in the intelligence of humans and machines. Here are my sources. Thank you for watching. Any questions? Thank you, Siddharth, for that amazing presentation about AI and biological intelligence. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. Let's wait one more minute and see if any other questions come up. Yeah. Um, can you, uh, okay. In the near future, is there a possibility that AI can outperform biological intelligence? There is a possibility, but there's also, it's also kind of unlikely because the, 
person is training an AI, so the person has to know what the AI knows when they're um, coding and training it. And can you show the resources slide um, for a couple? Um, yeah. Okay. I got more resources, but I couldn't fit it. And someone else is asking, what is the difference between AI and machine learning? There isn't a difference because I didn't research it. I Based on my research, I can't answer that question. You could Google it and find out. Okay. Thank you, um, Siddharth, for presenting. Uh, you did a great job. Thank you. I hope everyone had a great time, uh, and I hope you uh, and and I hope you all learned something new. We have over 15 viewers who joined and watched the event on YouTube Live, and over 80 viewers on the Zoom call. I'm seeing many thank you messages and thank you. I had a lot of fun on doing this event. In a couple of weeks, there will be a second STEM fair on July 11th and there's also a third event on August 9th. Here's the sneak peek at some of the future topics. August